Like many of us, I'm slowly returning back to the office at the moment, particularly now we're in uh, a couple of weeks into September uh, and more and more people are getting back from their summer holidays. As I do that, as we do that together, uh, we're getting back into the familiar rhythms of the office week. We're remembering the unique quirks, the unique patterns of working together. In particular, each Tuesday morning uh, at my office over in Wellen, uh, we're getting back into the rhythm of having to pause our calls uh, or our meetings uh, to for the weekly fire alarm test to subside around about between 10 and 10.15 a.m. each Tuesday morning. And somehow, despite the fact this test has been done pretty much since I've worked there uh, every Tuesday on the dot, uh, there's still that slightly nervous moment when the alarm rings for slightly longer than you're expecting and you wonder if instead of a 15 second pause to your morning, uh, you're going to have a 15 minute trudge into the car park uh, whilst you wait for someone to confirm that the alarm really ju was just an overdone piece of toast in the canteen. Mostly in the office we think of the fire alarm going off as some minor annoyance in our day, something we're vaguely aware of, something that we know might be important one day, uh, but we don't pay much attention to it. The consequences of that alarm could be really significant for us. The risk of ignoring the warning even could be severe, um, but because it's become so familiar, we might tune it out. It might just become part of the day-to-day -day noise, the mundane noise of everyday life. Maybe the gospel passage I have just read might be a bit like that fire alarm for some of us this morning. Maybe we've heard it several times before. Maybe we come across it fairly frequently in our Bible readings at home uh, or even here in church. And the seriousness of it, the shock of it, might have faded into the background. But unlike the fire alarm, where it's normally fine for us to shrug our shoulders, wait for it to switch itself off, this morning I think we need to pay attention. This passage, the challenge it holds up to us about how we perceive who Jesus is, what it means to follow him, is not something we can ignore forever. Friends, it's a call to action, a call to reflect on what our faith means to us, how it affects our daily lives. So this morning, as we look at these challenging words, can I challenge you to hear this passage afresh? And even as I'm speaking today, to be asking God how he wants you to respond to what he is saying to you through this scripture. I think the best way for us to dig into it, to understand what it's saying to us here today, uh, is to put ourselves in Simon Peter's shoes. Often the disciples' role in the Gospels, particularly Peter, is to stand in for us, to be the people we can relate to in the story. We see how these normal human beings responded to the shock of seeing the long-awaited saviour even walk into their neighbourhood, yet alone invite them to come along and join with him in his ministry. And as we look back and see how Peter and the other disciples responded to Jesus, it can help give a fresh perspective to us and to our own lives, our own hearts, uh, clarifying where Jesus might be calling us to a different response. And in this instance, we need to dig into and reflect on a reaction that initially doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And it definitely doesn't paint Peter at first glance in a particularly great light. It takes us just three verses today from Peter telling Jesus he is the Messiah. He's the long awaited saviour. He would come as God given king to try to sell Jesus off for not doing that job right. So there's a simple question for us to answer. What gives? What reason could Peter have for such an arrogant act? We're going to explore three possible reasons he might have had. And maybe in those reasons, we can find attitudes that we might share with Peter as we reflect on this passage today. So what's the first reason for Peter's objection? The message Jesus was saying, maybe to Peter, it didn't make much sense and it didn't match his expectations. I think we can say it's pretty likely that as a first century uh, Jewish man, uh, Peter would have expected the Messiah to come as a warrior king, a great military leader like David from the scriptures um, that he would have known and read. 
if that was the case, Peter would have thought, he would have known maybe, that what was needed was strength, not suffering. So when Jesus comes along, and when he starts saying that he must suffer, even die, to fulfil his purpose, surely Peter's response would have been one of confusion. How does dying help his people gain freedom? What use is going on a mission that you know is going to fail? Where was the actual plan to achieve the victory, to bring the freedom his nation was crying out for? I think all of us who know Jesus, a saviour and friend, have questions like that. Days, weeks, even seasons, where what God is doing and saying makes very little sense. Where it feels like the clever theology we hear in church, even what we read in our Bibles, isn't answering the real practical challenges we're facing or the questions we're asking. It does as well to remember that, oftentimes, the plans of God don't and aren't meant to immediately make sense. And often all of us struggle to see how and why God is working in a given situation. But sometimes we also need to hear the challenge, the rebuke of Jesus in this passage. Because sometimes the concerns of God are not human concerns. The challenges we see in this earth are real. Elsewhere in this Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus longs to speak into those problems, even to alleviate them through miraculous acts. But even so, he also often calls us to lift our eyes above those problems, to lift our eyes to the bigger story of salvation that God has for each and every one of us. God has spiritual work he is doing in us, through us, around us, that will bring greater freedom than we can have in this world. So if our only focus is on human concerns, the concerns we see in the world around us, then we need to hear this rebuke of Jesus this morning. And we need to remember that to follow him is to keep in mind the concerns of God. Second reason. This message didn't seem likely to Peter to win Jesus many new followers. I was recently walking uh, down the road uh, here in St Albans and passed uh, a pub which had uh, a few posters outside its door advertising the bands that were coming to play in the next few months. At first glance, the acts looked really good, almost unbelievable. Apparently The Clash uh, were coming to town in a couple of months. Uh, which sounded great, but too good to be true, really. Uh, not least because that particular band split up more than 30 years ago and definitely haven't reformed. And indeed, when you looked more closely at the poster in much smaller print, uh, you saw the words tribute band uh, hidden at the bottom of the poster. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to uh, pour cold water in that pub. I'm sure it was still a great night out. Uh, but the details in the small print made it much less exciting and appealing than it first appeared. That's how we expect people to communicate, especially in the modern world, but I suspect even in Peter's day. When you have people coming past, you might want to look in. We want to shout about the good news and leave the awkward details for later. So even if Peter could understand having a private chat with Jesus about how things might get tricky in a couple of years, how it might not all be healing some great wine from now on in, his instinct, probably our instinct as well, wouldn't have been announced it to all the disciples, wouldn't have been uh, to say it in the earshot of a crowd who'd gathered. Why would you lead with such a depressing, difficult to hear message when there was so much good, comforting, exciting news to share? Fortunately for us, though, Jesus wasn't and isn't interested in hiding the difficult bits in small print. He's not interested in hooking the crowd in before letting them know the catch. I don't think he wanted to attract followers with a slick sales pitch. Instead, he wanted uh, them to come to him with their eyes wide open. 
When you think about this a bit further, it's really difficult to imagine. The first word some of this crowd might have heard directly from Jesus is pick up your cross. In other words, be prepared for suffering and humiliation. It's not the kind of evangelistic talk I'd choose to give. But maybe it reminds us to share the gospel as it is. If people are surprised when Christianity is more costly than they first thought, when they're surprised, or if they're surprised, um, when they have a few difficult questions or many difficult questions um, after following Jesus for a few months or a few years. If that's the case, maybe we're not quite telling them the right story. As and when we have the opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with others, whether it's people uh, who don't believe or people who have newly come to believe. Let's remember Jesus' example here. Let's make sure we tell the whole story, not just the bits that seem the easiest sell. Those two reasons may have been going through Peter's head. Maybe similar things go through our thought processes from time to time as well. But to be honest, the third reason Peter might have responded like this, I think is the most likely. And at least for me, it would have been the reason why I might have tried to talk Jesus out of his new message to his followers. And this reason is fairly simple. This doesn't sound like a nice place to follow Jesus to. This is not in our heart of hearts what we want Jesus to be asking of us. We'd rather see the miracles, know the peace, be part of the community without the sacrifice, without the struggle, without the decision to turn away from earthly things, to turn towards the things of heaven. But there's no getting away from it. Jesus only has one call to those who would be his disciples. If we are to know the call to eternal life, the call to peace that passes all understanding, the call to a firm foundation of security and the love, the power, the salvation of God, then we are also called to a life of sacrifice. And this call is tough. In a town that had been renamed after Caesar, the the emperor of the occupying force who ruled with might from thousands of miles away in Rome. Jesus says to his listeners, pick up your cross. Clearly in our day, we know crucifixion in the context of the final days of Jesus's life. But to Jesus's hearers at that time, it would have been a potent symbol of what it meant to be ruled by a foreign power. To know the humiliation of being executed on the top of the hill, stripped of all your possessions, even the clothes off your back, shamed for standing against the ruling powers. This call to pick up your cross is a call to lose all earthly status. It's a call to suffering. It's a call to giving away literally all this world has to offer. Humanly speaking, I think we can all understand why Peter didn't want this to be the message Jesus told his followers. This is a difficult thing to hear. But this morning, we will all do well. We will all gain Uh, from not letting this call to sacrifice, to pick up our crosses, pass us by this morning. In a minute, I'll lead us in a prayer, asking God to show us what this means for us uh, and give us the courage to follow that call. But before I do, let's look at two reasons really quickly um, why we should wrestle with that, why we should ultimately follow that call this morning. Firstly, It's important to remember that wrestling with this, even trying to talk Jesus out of his call, arguing with it, questioning it, in no way excludes us from knowing his love and seeing his glory. Just six days after he talked to the crowd about the way of the cross, Jesus took Peter along with two of his other closest disciples up a mountain where they would see an extraordinary display of his glory. Many of you at this service will know it as the Transfiguration. Peter didn't get some demotion for his outburst. He didn't have to sit on the proverbial naughty step for a few months, reflecting on what a fool he was for questioning the king of the universe. No. 
He stays close to Jesus. He continues to be welcomed in to see his glory, to learn what it means to follow him. So firstly, let's remember that we have a God of grace, a God who knows these things are hard to hear and respond to, and longs to walk with us as we slowly understand what it means to put what we hear into practice. And then secondly, let's remind ourselves of the benefits of this call. Even if, even when, there is a lot to lose from following Jesus, we also know there is so much to gain. Even when it's hard, the way of Jesus is still life and life to the full. Jesus can say with confidence that it is no good to have the whole world and lose your soul because he knows the life we find in him is of so much more worth than anything, anything the world has to offer. This morning, this message is an incredible challenge, but it still remains good news. For even when he calls us to give everything on this earth away, even then we can know that Christ still has more to give us in return. So friends, will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we accept this morning that your call is to pick up our crosses and to follow you. Lord, forgive us those times where we look to avoid that call. Where we let it become background noise and get on with our lives, ignoring the alarm ringing in the background. But God, today, would you help us in small ways and in big to know what it means as we go about the rest of our day, the rest of our week and beyond. Thank you that you um, are patient with us. You help us to follow this call and we pray this morning that you would be our help and our guide as we look to follow you. And that we would know even in the suffering and the hardship and the sacrifice, the joy and the life that come from knowing you and following you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.